All right, so today we're going to continue on with our, our statistical tests and the different figures of merit. You know, last time we, we discussed, uh, really it focused in a lot on the hypothesis testing with the null hypothesis and alternative hypothesis. And uh, Kobe pointed out something interesting. Tell them what the language was uh, that we were talking about, failing to... So we've never really accepted the hypothesis and just failed the project. And that was in biology that they were emphasizing that kind of language? Yeah. And so what's the slight difference? This is a good discussion topic. So the difference between accepting the null hypothesis because of the statistical test or failing to reject it? I mean, the end result's the same, right? You're saying we're not gonna we're not gonna stay with our null hypothesis, we're gonna go with the alternative. But the language is a little different, isn't it? Science is like always evolving. So like, if you like accept something now, you may figure out later that like something oh. may not be so accurate and that actually it wasn't. Yeah, true. you are really making different claims. If you accept the null hypothesis, you're saying I, it's true, right? You're accepting that that's a true statement versus failing to reject it. Like it may or may not be true, but with this statistical test, I failed to reject it. You're not really making as much of a commitment in that point, right? Um, think about how how the level of commitment would change if you know at the altar the <laughs> minister said, "Do you fail to reject this person as your wife?" <laughs> He's like, "I do." <laughs> that wouldn't carry the same weight as, as as you know. So it's a little more tentative. It's saying, "Yeah, I fail to reject the the null hypothesis because of the statistical tests." And so I think that. Again, it's more like being more conservative in terms of giving someone your worst case scenario in terms of your confidence limits, and then also, uh, you know, saying, I, "Well, I, statistical tests would not allow us to reject the whole, null hypothesis." So that's pretty cool. And so today we're going to talk about the, the normal distribution and then various ways it can go wrong. Looking at the data, so when we get these histograms of our data, we can look at those and see if they they seem to represent. Uh, a normal distribution or not. And so these were the graphical summaries for the data that we had in the last lecture. This was for the trainee. And up there in the top right hand corner of the graphical summary is the Anderson Darling normality test. And it has an A squared value, which uh, we could look up, but it has a P value as well. And so if you're looking at that and you say, okay, I've got a P value, that's a probability that the null hypothesis is true, but you don't know what the null hypothesis is. And so that's the thing. You don't want to use a p-value or talk about a test without knowing what that null hypothesis is. Now, when, we, when I started this, I looked at it as like, I've never heard of the Anderson-Darling normality test. And so where do you go? Well, this was produced by Minitab, the software. And so you go to the help file. And so if you don't understand something in Excel or Minitab or whatever, go to the help file and look that term up. And so if I would go to the help file, I can look up the Anderson-Darling normality test. And this is what it is. The null hypothesis for that test is that the data follow a normal distribution. Okay. And the alternative would be the data do not follow a normal distribution. So the p-value is the probability that HO is true. And so that would be the probability that the data is normally distributed. And so you can compute this AD test for other distributions too, but we typically use a normal distribution curve. So that's the one that's included by default. And so let's go back. Actually, let's go back to that one. Uh, so in our trainees' data, the p-value that is the probability that this is a normal distribution is 0.196. Okay. So we would fail to reject that null hypothesis because it's not less than 0.05. Okay. So we're not saying it is normally distributed, but we fail to say it's not. <laughs> okay. So, <clears throat> now let's look at the uh, forensic chemist. So this p-value is 0 0.017. And so we're saying that the forensic chemist's data is not, no, not normally distributed. Okay. But we, we fail to reject the fact that it is. So, I mean, we, yeah, we do reject the fact <coughs> that it is because it's point, less than 0 0.05. And you can look at the histogram. And then you've got this blue curve that represents the normal distribution. And <clears throat> the forensic chemists, when they ran these analyses in the histogram, you see that they get uh, 
essentially these represent one, one value in this bin, one value in that bin, four identical values in this bin. So they got an answer within plus or minus whatever the limits are in this bin, four times there and three times here. And so that's not what a normal distribution looks like. A normal distribution is, is most in the middle and a few on the wings. And so we can say it's not normally distributed, but what, what other kinds of figures of merit, in other words, numbers, can we put to this distribution? And those other kinds of tests are down here, the skewness and the kurtosis. So the kurtosis is close to 1, the skewness is 1.3. So today we're going to learn about these two terms, and then we're going to also talk about multimodal data, data that contains more than one distribution underneath it. So what are some ways that a, that a normal distribution can fail, right? If it's just a single value and it's only been perturbed by random distributions, random errors or uncertainties, then that would give you a normal distribution. And so anything that differs from a normal distribution may have buried into it something that's not random. Do you follow the logic? If it's just a single value and there's only random errors that are bumping it around, you would see the most probable result in the middle, and it would taper off as you go to the right and to the left. So that would be a normal distribution if all you had was a single value with random fluctuations. If it tapers off to one side, that's not random. If it tapers off to the other side, that's not random. If it's got two peaks, then you've got two distributions. You've got two answers that are being, being you know, oscillated with random fluctuations. And so there's uh, multi -way, multiple ways that this can cannot be normal. So one of those is kurtosis. So this is for the trainee. And you see all the way across you have uh, answers of ones, but in the very middle you have two tall bins that have three answers each, the three results each. And so the kurtosis value, if you go to the Minitab stat guide, is, is how peaked the data is. And so compare this, if it's a positive kurtosis value, it's saying it's mostly flat with a very peaked center. And that's not a normal distribution, okay? But it might be two. So this is, again, an example of maybe a multi-mode data that have the same means but different uncertainties. So you could probably draw two normal distributions on here. One that has a really narrow width, like this. and then one that has a really broad width. So that's a way that you can have uh, a, a high kurtosis value. It's, it could be multi-mode data. Multi-mode means two, really two different types of measurements sitting on top of each other. You may never find the sources of those, but you might. If you investigate the trainees, he had to run 10 samples, right, he or she, and you ask them, well, how did you do your data? Let's look at your lab notebook. Oh, well, I ran, you know, four or five before lunch. And then we went out to lunch and had lunch and then, you know, did our normal thing of a couple of beers over lunch. And then I ran the, ran, ran the next five <laughs> after lunch. And this is a fictitious example. But, but do you think the uncertainty might change before and after a couple of strong, you know, Carboc ales, <laughs> 12 points? percent ABV. <laughs> you know, so there's an example where the uncertainty may have changed, but the, the mean may not. And, and you've, you've got definitely something you could point to that would say, okay, I see where the sources of these two uncertainties came from. And so that would be sharply peaked. What about flat peaked? Well, it may also be multi-mode. You may have uh, several Gaussian curves under here just overlapped, all with about the same intensity. And when you add those together, you get this sharp rise and then kind of a flat top and then a sharp drop off. Okay. I'm not exactly sure, you know, what scenario might give that, but maybe the instrument's drifting, you know, and you run a sample, two or three samples, and then the next time you get them prepped, there's, the machine's drifted a little bit. And so then 
your uncertainty is a certain amount, but then the machine is drifting and kind of smearing it one way. So that's kurtosis, and the flat, flat peak would be negative kurtosis, and a sharp peak would be positive kurtosis. And so we can go back to our, our um, trainee, and we see a positive kurtosis, because it's flat across the bottom, but it's got a sharp middle, and it peaks up in the middle. And so then the skewness value, the, the trainee is skewed at 1.13, not very much. Okay. You see the data is pretty symmetric. You have this outlier at 15, but you see that you know it, it tails a little bit to the right because of that outlier, but we're saying that's an outlier, so it's not representative of the Gaussian curve. And so it's you know it's fairly symmetric around around this tall peak in the middle. But look at the uh, at the forensic chemist. It's definitely skewed to the right. And so this is what you know a skewed distribution looks like. It's strong on one side and then it t tapers off like that. So that would be an example of a skewed distribution. And if it's a positive or uh, skewness, it would go to the to the right. Okay. And if it's a negative, it would be left skewed. So here's a couple of examples: positive uh, skewed data is skewed to the right, and a, and a negative skew is skewed to the left or to lower values. Typically we plot them low to high from left to right, and so um, right skewed is skewed to high values. And one of the best examples for you to remember for this is that positive skew values are almost always the way salaries are salaries. So, so if you plot salaries in a large corporation and you look at the histogram, <laughs> You're going to have a few people making really high salaries, and then the vast majority of the company making mid-range and lower salaries. And so then what happens when you have uh, data that's skewed is these really high numbers will drag the, the mean up here. So this will be the mean. But notice how the mean is the mean salary is not the most probable salary. It's certainly not the entry salary. And so anytime you hear, and this is just a tip about reading the news with a skeptical eye, anytime you hear somebody talking about salaries, if they use the mean salary, they're 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 doing that for a reason. They're that's not what you quote. You quote the median salary. This is the best example of when the median is important, not the mean. If you list all the salaries from high to low, and you go to the very middle one, that's the median. Not the average, the median. So that's going to be probably this one. If you list all these high to low, it's probably going to be over here somewhere. So the mean, or the median is going to be over here. And so that's your first test when you're reading something, if someone's right, reporting on a, a company or a situation and they quote the median salary, they've passed at least one of the tests for legit reporting. <laughs> okay, so you can use that as, a, as your skeptical reading skill to say whenever talking about salaries, you need to talk about the median salaries because that's the most expected salary. If you're coming into this company in the mid-range, not the entry level, you can look at the median salary and see, am I at least making the median salary in the company? And if they, uh, if you're not, then you can ask, well, what, you know, where's my position relative to the median salary? Um, the mean salary, there may not be anybody that makes the mean salary because there may be a couple of, you know, senior managers and then a gap of zero and then a bunch of folks that turn the screws and type in the numbers. Okay. I don't know of an example of left skewed data. Now, sometimes the, the, the salary data will have another bump over here. And so you'll see a, a large distribution that's skewed uh, to the right, and then you'll have another bump here, and that's multimodal data because you have two, two distributions. You have uh, sort of the, the staff level and then the supervisor level. And the, so you'll have two distributions, and anytime you have more than one distribution, that's multimode, multimodal data.
Now, the skewness value tells you whether it's sy symmetric or not. And your, your data can be symmetric and still not be normally distributed. Like the bottom one is symmetric, but it's not normal. <laughs> That's definitely multimodal data. Or in this case, it's bimodal because there's two of them. So that doesn't, just because the skewness, may not, may it says lack of skewness alone doesn't mean it's normally distributed. It just means whether it's symmetric or not. And so let's go through a couple of case studies. Uh, these are some things that I've put together uh, in Minitab. And so let's talk about the, the process capability for the trainee. So let's say that anything less than 10% cocaine, which, I mean, this is kind of a fictitious thing. So it's, it's less than 10% cocaine. So down here, we would say not a controlled substance, or say not. Um, I'll say not guilty. <laughs> okay. So we'll, with the mean and standard deviation of the trainee, he could have a false negative. Do you see that? And this is a capability analysis that Minitab does for you automatically. And so you could set your, your lower specification limit, and I just picked 10. Okay and say 10% is our lower specification limit. Let's look at the trainee's data. How many false negatives would our trainee have? And that's what it calculates here. The parts per million less than the lower specification limit is 972. Okay, that's about 0.1%. So out of a thousand analyses, one person is gonna get a false negative. So they're gonna get by having 13% cocaine sample in their pocket and they test it as negative, less than 10, okay? And so let's compare that then to the forensic chemist. Same specification limit, same samples, 13%, but look at what the uncertainty analysis does, okay? So the forensic chemist has such a tight distribution that they can test down to 13% and still have less than 0.001 parts per million. I mean, they're not gonna have a false negative if the sample has 13.2% cocaine in it. So you can really see how this uncertainty analysis can impact uh, your false negative rate or false positive rates. Okay. And again, this is a, an example of some of the canned analyses that Minitab offers you. I think they're, they're really uh, fantastic for analyzing data. You didn't have to go in and put in all the formulas yourself. You know, it's great that I taught you Excel, but that Excel, there are other packages out there. <laughs> and things like Minitab really help you. I was looking at the website this morning to kind of see if the stack guide was available online. And it's not, but there's, um, there's, let's, let's keep this. I just wanted to show you one of their little advertisements that they have. I don't get anything from them, by the way. This is it's no disclaimers that need to be made. But I did like this down here. It said, uh, let's see. well, they changed their ads. It talked about how many Fortune 500 companies Use uh, use mini tab. Let's see. Who's this? No, nope, get back. <coughs> well, maybe that was just it. It was, uh, it was something on the order of ninety percent of the Fortune five hundred companies, no mini tab. So if you were to do some of the optional exercises that I have in here. Um, 
it's available on campus, but if you have trouble downloading it or whatever, you can start a 30-day free trial and then just let them use the free trial to take, check it out. That'll be enough to teach you how to do the graphical summaries. And uh, again, knowing how to do the graphical summaries and maybe this process capability analysis would be a nice introduction. So you could put on your resume uh, that you've had some exposure to Minitab. So, you know, that name alone may be something that would cause you to get an interview. Okay. So you want to take advantage of everything that you can in order to make yourself uh, make the short list, <laughs> you know, people they bring in for an interview. So is it required? No, it's not required, but if you want to get that interview, you might want to consider it. I would not put in that you're proficient in Minitab, <laughs> right? but again, you could put in, I've been exposed to Minitab and looked at some of the, you know, tools that it has to offer. So. Here's another example. This was a cleaning example that I did in my lab. <clears throat> we took these aluminum coupons, because that's the research that I do, and we greased them up, and uh, actually, no, this was the clean one, the original clean one. We did contact angle, and if you notice up there at the top, this water drop wets the aluminum surface and so this angle here on the inside of the drop is the contact angle and it's a metal oxide layer and it's water and water and metal oxide attract each other you know they're polar so like seeks like and so that water will wet the metal surface if it's clean this is the test that they do if they're going to uh, paint a surface or do some sort of surface finishing They'll make sure they get all of the grease and oils off from the machining, and then they'll, they'll clean it. They'll do a test with a water drop to see if the contact angle is low. Then they know they've got down to the bare metal oxide, and then they can paint it. Okay. So it's a clean, cleanliness test or a surface preparation test. <clears throat> and so we were looking at our, our cleaning procedures in the lab, and so we had these aluminum uh, plates. They're called coupons. And we test all of our cleaning procedures using these witness coupons. So we cleaned them. This was the baseline cleaning. We wiped it down with hexane and, <clears throat> and then uh, tested the contact angle. And it came in at 60 degrees. Right? And so uh, a higher contact angle would be hydrophobic. And so that would be, this would be dirty here. All right, so you see this is a, a larger than 90 degree contact angle. And so this is pretty clean, 60 degree contact angle, plus or minus. So you see this is a, a nice Gaussian distribution. The normality test comes in with a p-value. The probability that it's normally distributed is 0.8. That's great. So that's 80% uh, chance that it's normally distributed. So then we slopped it up with grease, vacuum grease, and did a contact angle. So with the grease, is what we call gross contamination. You can see the dirt, the grease on there not dirt, but soil, what we call matter out of place is called soil. So we just have grease on there and it's not supposed to be there. We did the contact angle and there's some roughness to the grease. And so sometimes the measurements of contact angle are difficult to do. And so that's why we see a couple of measurements down here at 80. Uh, but this is our, our distribution for the gross contamination. So it comes in at around 110, 103 is the mean. The median is, um, is 105 degrees. So then we take a chem wipe, wipe all the grease off. You cannot see any on there. So it looks like a clean coupon. <laughs> but water is, this is the point. I mean, water can tell you if it's dirty or not. You wiped it all off and you can't see any grease on there. But you put water on there and it's hydrophobic. So that's not a good surface to paint. Your paint's going to beat up just like the water if it's a water-based paint. And so then you're, you're paint's not going to stick to that surface. Uh, it may look like it's dried and everything, but later it'll blister and, and flake off. And so a lot of times failed paint jobs, they didn't prep the surface. Uh, and they never even considered testing with a water drop to see if the surface was prepped or not. I, I, it's a curse. You know, I walk through places and I see paint jobs and I'm like, they didn't test that. <laughs> <laughs> like if they repainted the walkway at one of the middle schools or whatever, and I'm picking up my kid and I'm like, Oh man, the paint was all flaked off and everything. I was like, you guys, you just, you know, surface prep's important, come on. <laughs> so yeah, so this, uh, this looked clean, but it was clearly dirty and the water tested that. Uh, again, the median 103, not much difference in contact angle at all. So then we ran it through ultrasound 
with n-propyl bromide to rip off the, the grease and then uh, a rinse with methanol and air dry and boom. Now we're even cleaner than we were at the beginning. So the ultrasonic bath really pulled that grease out of the pores and had a really nice porous uh, oxide layer. A very narrow uh, distribution. Our contact angle now is at, at 47 median, uh, 47 degrees, and last time it was around 60. So it's actually cleaner than it was. So that was, uh, again, just a real use of statistics in my lab. Using Minitab it was so nice to use Minitab rather than Excel. You think I just love Excel, and it's okay, it's fun, it's my hobby, you know. But <laughs> but uh, when I can just sit there and put my data in and go, you know, stat, graphical summary, what column I want, go, and phew, I get this. That's so nice. I didn't have to go in and type in the formulas and hit copy down and everything. <laughs> so you guys know well what I'm talking about. <laughs> so, so let's get to a cahoot and kind of ask you some questions about these different terms that we've learned today. Here's the code, 327085. 24 people. Two more. <coughs> One more. Is anybody not playing? Okay, we'll wait for you. Oh, we are? Did we? Did I miscount? I did. Eight, 12, 16, 20, 40. Okay, good. All right, good. Didn't we call anybody out? <laughs> All right, so let's go. So the distribution, this distribution of income is, and there's the picture of it, normally distributed, exhibiting negative kurtosis, skewed to the right to high values, or skewed to the left to low values. And you can't probably see, but the, the high salaries are on the right, low salaries are on the right. Okay. <laughs> You're aiming for the speed. You're actually one of the speed points. <laughs> yes. All right, so it's yeah, it's skewed to high values. We were saying, and the key there would be salaries almost always. Uh, yeah, I don't know examples where it's not, unless you have a really top-heavy company. <laughs> Everybody's a manager, nobody's turning the screws. This distribution of otter hound deaths is, I just went out and grabbed things. So this is age of death, the low age is on the left, the older dogs are on the right. So the bimodal, skewed left to low values, skewed right to high values are normally distributed. And there might be more than one answer that's right, so pick one that you like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so both the top ones were going to be right. It's skewed to the left to low values, but it's also bimodal. So let's look at that. Can you see what I'm talking about by bimodal data? Yes. Yeah, you see two humps. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I've got two humps. That means I've got two distributions on top of each other. And... It's skewed as well. Okay. Okay. The forensic chemist results were not normally distributed, so their work should be suspect. Okay, so I'm happy. Yes, it's false. Their, their work is, it doesn't mean their work is bad. Why would it not be normally distributed? Because 
Okay, not many fluctuations. Uh, you're almost there, not many somethings. Yeah? Do you think that this might be a sampling error? They only ran 10 samples. Okay, and so you really can't get the character of the distribution with just 10 samples. So if they kept running them, let's say they did over 15, you know, we kind of say that's a break point for understanding the, the distribution, 15 or more. But, if, but even then, it may still not quite be uh, normally distributed. But you would definitely tell if it was skewed right or left by the time you got to 15 or more samples. Uh, if it was multimodal. Yeah, there's lots of things, and then also sampling location. We don't know exactly how homogeneous the powder is. The, the, making a powder homogeneous is difficult. It's really difficult. We had that at Pantex with our explosive formulations, trying to get the, the, the mixture to be homogeneous. It was difficult. Question number four. U.S. spending on science correlates with suicide by hanging. <laughs> yes, this goes back to those spurious correlations. So U.S. spending in science correlates with suicide by hanging. And the R square value is, um, oh, it's not written on there, but that looks like about 0.999. Okay. Oh, only one was brave enough to say, so what? <laughs> <laughs> Just because it's correlated doesn't mean there's any kind of causal relationship. Okay? So spending more on science is not going to cause people to hang themselves. You know? mm -hmm. Although maybe the humanities. They're like, they're taking all the money. <laughs> <laughs> I'm done with this cruel world. No, the true, the, it's, yes, it correlates. But again, there's no causal relationship that we could... Fine. Now, you might do some investigation to prove that it is not or is correlated, I mean, is uh, causal, but that th there's really doesn't appear to be any causal link to this. And that's what that, that Tyler Vegan site is uh, listing is just many, many spurious correlations. And just wanted to emphasize that one more time that correlation does not mean there's a causal relationship. All right, great job. Okay, so what we're going to do next is introduce sort of a little bit of the next set of notes because that's the calibration examples. And I'd like to spend, you know, the rest of this class and the next Tuesday going over these calibration examples in great detail. So we're really going to emphasize how to deal with, with the calibration and quantitation. <clears throat> And this also is a, a good example of the use of the propagation of uncertainty.